Hello, and thanks for watching. Today, I'll talk about work that I did with collaborators at the University of Washington and Microsoft Research on improving memory management for mobile operating systems. Uh, and so some quick disclaimers before I begin. Uh, I currently work at Google, not on Android, uh, but this work is not connected with Google in any way. Uh, this is research that I did when I was a graduate student at the University of Washington. Uh, all of our data is from our own experiments or open source resources, uh, and all opinions, thoughts, and speculation are our own. Uh, and so in this talk, uh, I'll start by talking about our motivation for working on mobile memory management. Uh, then I'll move on to our key insight and the system called Marvin that we built based on that insight, uh, and then talk about Marvin's low-level mechanisms uh, and the high-level features that we built on top of those mechanisms. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about our implementation and evaluation. Today's mobile memory management is bad for both users and applications. Uh, on both Android and iOS, each app gets a fixed maximum memory budget, uh, and the operating system kills apps when the device runs out of memory. Uh, so let's say you have a phone with two gigabytes of RAM, and each app is allowed a 512 megabyte memory budget. So you start up one app, and it takes up a quarter of your phone's memory. Uh, you start up three more, uh, and your phone's memory footprint is entirely filled. And now if you want to start up a fifth app, your phone is going to have to start killing apps. And that's true even if apps are not actively using their memory. So let's say that first app has a working set that's only half of its memory footprint. And let's say the same is true for the other apps. Uh, the operating system is not going to be able to identify uh, and use the unused memory. It's going to have to still kill entire apps. And so this is a problem for a few reasons. One is that restarting apps takes a significant amount of time. Uh, we did a study where we measured the startup times of popular Android apps and compared those times to the time it would take to read the app's entire memory image in from disk. And we found that the startup times were much higher. It's also a problem because developers have to put a lot of time and effort into optimizing app memory usage. Uh, they have to make sure their apps don't go over that maximum memory budget, and they're also encouraged to shrink their app's memory footprint as much as possible uh, so that the OS doesn't target their app to kill. Traditional desktop operating systems would swap unused memory to disk to deal with this problem, but traditional swapping is not a solution in the mobile environment. And this is true for a few reasons. And one problem is that traditional swapping is not a good fit for managed languages like Java. Uh, one reason is garbage collection. Uh, so let's say you have uh, some pages of memory and objects spread across those pages pointing to each other. If one of those pages gets swapped out, then when the garbage collector runs, it's going to have to walk the heap, chase down those pointers, and it's going to have to touch those objects on the swapped out page and cause that page to be swapped back in. Uh, another problem is that uh, the operating system's working set estimator is similarly going to get confused and think that the app is using that page when in reality, the app is not touching that page at all, it's just the garbage collector. Yeah. Also, uh, when the operating system does swapping and working set estimation at the page granularity, that's not a good fit when objects are not page sized. Let's say you had a page of memory, uh, and it was filled with objects that are a mix of hot objects that are being accessed frequently and cold objects uh, that are untouched. Uh, from the operating system's perspective, this entire page is going to look hot even if in reality, only half of the objects are being used. Finally, traditional swapping isn't a good fit for latency-sensitive touch devices, like modern smartphones. Uh, and the reason is that uh, when the operating system swaps unused memory to disk on demand when performing an allocation, that can cause lengthy stuttering and delays on the allocation critical path. So we did a study where we enabled a Linux swap file on an Android device, uh, and we measured the amount of time it took to allocate 500 megabytes of memory uh, with and without memory pressure. Uh, and under memory pressure, that allocation took close to eight seconds. And so eight seconds is just way too long of a delay to have on the allocation critical path. So now I wanna talk about uh, our key insight and the system we built based on it. And our key insight is this. We can co-design the runtime and the operating system to improve mobile memory management. And this is something that's possible 
because modern mobile platforms like Android and iOS require all apps to use the same runtime. So we built a new memory manager for Android called Marvin, which is co-designed with Android's Java runtime. And Marvin is going to reintroduce swapping to the mobile environment. And Marvin does so with three main features. Uh, the first is that it checkpoints unused memory to disk ahead of time uh, so that allocations can happen more quickly. Marvin also performs working set estimation and swapping at the object granularity rather than the page granularity. And finally, Marvin has a swap-aware garbage collector that you can think of as a modified version of the bookmarking garbage collector from PLDI 2005. Uh, before getting into those high-level features, though, I want to talk about the low-level mechanisms that we use to build them. Uh, and there are three main low-level mechanisms that we use. Uh, the first are stubs, which provide an indirection layer between objects. Uh, the second is the reclamation table, which allows the runtime and operating system to coordinate. And finally, uh, object access interposition uh, lets the runtime transparently take action when app code runs. And I'll talk about each of these in detail. So we need an indirection layer between objects referencing each other. Uh, and the reason is that we need to be able to catch accesses to swapped out objects in app code so that we can swap the object back in. And to do that, we use something called stubs, which are small pseudo objects that sit in the Java heap and they point to the underlying real object. Uh, and they also store copies of the real object references. Uh, and in general, we found that in Android apps, uh, references tend to take up a pretty small portion of objects' memory footprints. And so storing copies of the references in the stubs allowed us to still keep the stubs nice and small. We also need a way for the runtime and operating system to coordinate. Uh, the runtime needs to be able to tell the OS which object can be reclaimed, and it also needs to be able to uh, make sure that the OS doesn't try to reclaim an object while the runtime is accessing. And for that, we use a shared memory reclamation table. Uh, the reclamation table stores, uh, for every swappable object, it stores the object's location, size, and a set of metadata bits that the runtime and the OS use for locking. Finally, the runtime needs a way to transparently act when app code accesses objects. Uh, it needs to be able to restore swapped out objects, update working set metadata, and more generally, use the stub and reclamation table uh, when app code runs. And for that, uh, we use object access interposition, which is a set of paired interpreter and compiler modifications uh, that implement these different transparent actions. Uh, so on the interpreter side, the interpreter is going to uh, directly act when it's executing bytecode instructions that access objects. Uh, and on the compiler side, the compiler, uh, when it converts a bytecode instruction accessing an object to ARM64 assembly code, it'll generate additional ARM64 instructions before and after the object access. So now I'll talk about how we use these low-level mechanisms to build Marvin's high-level features. So for ahead-of-time swap, uh, for every object, we're going to maintain a dirty bit in the object header. Uh, and the runtime is going to use object access interposition to make sure that that dirty bit gets set whenever app code modifies an object. Uh, and so the dirty bit is going to be 1 if the object's memory footprint differs from its checkpointed image on disk, uh, and it'll be 0 uh, if the memory footprint and the checkpointed image are the same. And so if app code runs and modifies an object, uh, both the interpreter and the compiled code are going to set that dirty bit. And then in the background, the runtime will checkpoint objects to disk. Uh, and after the runtime saves an object, uh, it's going to go and clear that dirty bit. And finally, when the kernel wants to reclaim an object, it'll first check that dirty bit, and only if the dirty bit is cleared will the kernel reclaim the object. Uh, so moving on to object level working set estimation. Uh, so for our working set estimation, uh, we're going to use a round-based approach, where every object uh, in the header, there's going to be both short-term metadata uh, that says 
whether the object's been accessed this round, uh, and then also longer term uh, shift registers that track access patterns across rounds. And so the runtime is going to use object access interposition to set those short term access bits uh, when app code accesses an object. So let's say application code uh, reads an object, then both the interpreter and compiled code will set the object's read bit. Then, for doing access tracking across rounds, uh, we're going to periodically invoke the garbage collector and piggyback off of the garbage collector's heap blocks. So, when the garbage collector visits the object, uh, we'll look at those short-term access bits and update the longer-term shift registers. Okay. And finally, we'll talk about our uh, swap-aware garbage collector. So, our garbage collector is uh, going to use object access interposition to make sure that stubs always have up-to-date copies of their object's references. Uh, so if app code uh, sets an object's reference member variable, uh, the interpreter and compiled code are going to update that member variable in both the stub and the underlying object. And now when the garbage collector runs, it can check for the presence of stubs. And when it finds a stub, it can read references directly off of the sub, uh, and it won't have to touch the underlying object. Uh, and so importantly, this means that if the underlying object is swapped out, the garbage collector does not have to swap it back in. Finally, I'll talk about our implementation and evaluation of MARP. So for our implementation, uh, we modified the Android runtime, or ART, to implement the Marvin runtime. Uh, and our Marvin runtime has a default policy where it always keeps the foreground apps objects in memory. Uh, and this is to prevent uh, any swapping activity from occurring on the user interface thread. And for our experiments, we triggered reclamation directly in the runtime, uh, and so we didn't need to make any kernel modifications. Uh, for our evaluation, we used Pixel XL phones uh, running either Android 7.1.1 or our modified version of that. Uh, and we set out to talk about three main questions. Uh, one is, uh, does Marvin let users run more applications? Uh, the second is, does ahead of time swap work? And finally, uh, what is Marvin's overhead? So uh, to find out whether Marvin lets users run more apps, uh, we created a benchmark app, which allocates a heap with a mixture of four kilobyte and one megabyte arrays, uh, and it periodically deletes and reallocates a small fraction of those arrays every five seconds. Uh, and we periodically started instances of that benchmark app over time uh, and measured how many instances were running simultaneously. And what we measured were the number of active apps. Uh, and these are apps that are both alive and making progress on their workloads. Uh, so if an instance of our benchmark app is alive, uh, but it fails to perform a round of deletion or reallocation for more than 20 seconds, uh, we consider it inactive. Uh, and so this means that an app that, that's technically alive but is essentially frozen won't count as active. Uh, and so we found that, indeed, Marvin uh, does support running over twice as many apps as on modified Android. Uh, and on Android, with a Linux swap file enabled, we found that uh, it would keep apps technically alive, but past a certain point, uh, the apps would all freeze up due to their small amount of allocation activity, which has caused a ton of swap of thrashing activity and swapping. Uh, and furthermore, uh, Android with a Linux swap file consistently crashed early in our experiments because it was generally unstable. So we found that Marvin could run uh, over twice as many active apps as both unmodified Android and Android with a Linux swap file. So to investigate whether ahead of time swap works, uh, we measured how long it took our Marvin prototype to reclaim memory. Uh, and we found that it took uh, around 100 milliseconds to reclaim 500 megabytes of memory when we triggered reclamation. Uh, and so when we compare that to our earlier measurement of how long it takes to allocate 500 megabytes of memory on Android with a Linux swap file under memory pressure, uh, Marvin's reclamation time of 100 milliseconds is much faster than the Android allocation time 
of close to eight seconds. Uh, and this isn't quite an apples to apples comparison uh, because we're triggering reclamation directly in Marvin, whereas we're inducing it through allocation on Android, uh, but it does illustrate the big difference uh, in order of magnitude of those reclamation times. Uh, finally, we wanted to investigate the execution overhead of Marvin's object access interpolation. Uh, and we used a synthetic benchmark to show that that overhead depends on the proportion of object accesses in application bytecode. Uh, and to get a sense of what that overhead looks like in real apps, uh, we ran the PC mark for Android benchmark uh, on Marvin with swapping disabled, uh, and we found that Marvin's scores uh, for those benchmarks that measure Java code or were within 15% of the scores for unmodified Android. Uh, and finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the related work. Uh, there are several systems uh, that focus on Android memory management. Uh, Acclaim is a system appearing in this conference, and there's also been SmartSwap, A2S, and Mars recently. Uh, and in some ways, these systems are similar to Mars. Uh, one similarity that they all have with Marvin is that they have policies that distinguish between foreground and background apps. Uh, because it makes sense to prioritize the foreground app when that's the one that the user is directly interacting with. Uh, Mars also uh, addresses this incompatibility between runtime garbage collectors and kernel level swap. Uh, these systems also have some differences from Marvin. Uh, the most important one is that uh, all of them perform swapping at the kernel level rather than at the runtime level. So in conclusion, uh, we set out to address uh, this problem that mobile memory management today doesn't work very well. Uh, and our insight is that we could co-design the runtime and the operating system to improve mobile memory management. Uh, and uh, the way we did that is by building Marvin, a new memory manager for Android that improves memory management with three co-design features, uh, ahead of time swap, object level working set estimation, and bookmarking garbage collection. All right, thanks for watching. Uh, our source code for Marvin is available on GitHub, uh, and my email address is nl35 at cs.washington.edu if you have any questions. Thanks.